What would be the hardest material to build a building out of? Yeah, see, I knew it. Um, so, so these, those kind of nanotubes that I was talking about earlier is, is actually what we think will be one of the strongest materials that will develop in time. Um, it's a kind of complicated question to answer in that it's not just the hardness of a material that makes it really strong for a structure. So there's two different ways in which structure can fail. So if you think about um, a column, which I can kind of make from my bit of paper here, if I, if I push down on this, one thing that can happen is that it can crumple, and that will happen if this material is not very hard. So you put a really nice hard material in there, and it won't crumple as easily. But the other thing it can do is actually bend. And that bending is actually more a function of how tall that is, how slender this is, what the shape of the column is. So you need to kind of bring together both different types of the way a structure fails. And then you can figure out what the strongest material or shape is that you can build with. But what I'll be interested to see is, is what material scientists and, and physicists come up with in, t in terms of these carbon nanotubes and, and graphene. At the moment, it's concrete. A long way to go. <laughs> right, next question, please. Do you have a least favorite skyscraper? <laughs> <laughs> they are hard questions, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> I, can, can, we, can we rephrase who's allowed to ask questions? Um, I, you know, it, I don't have a least favorite skyscraper. And the reason for that is even the really ugly ones have clever engineering in them. And I'm more interested in what engineering goes into the structure rather than necessarily just what it might look like. So that's you know, a, a difficult one to answer. And, and I also think I don't necessarily find a skyscraper on its own ugly. What happens is when you put lots of different ones right next to each other, or you know, it, or it's kind of a strange skyscraper in, in a place where it doesn't really fit in that can make things look strange. Um, but yeah, there's always interesting engineering happening. So that, that's, that's what I'm most interested in. That's a terrible answer, but it's that's what you're going to get. <laughs> there was right. one question in the green jumper. Um, I was just wondering, are buildings still built with the steel core after 9-11? It's a really good question. Um, so, I'm going to slightly put a proviso on this, but I think this is correct, that the reason they build steel cores in the US is because, you know, skyscrapers, especially offices, are generally built from steel because it's lighter. Let, let me just kind of give a slightly simplistic thing there. So, so you're using steel to build the rest of the structure. My understanding is that the steel unions and the concrete unions, the workers, don't work with each other. And that is the reason why traditionally in Manhattan, in New York, buildings are either made from concrete or from steel. And so therefore, many of the skyscrapers in New York have steel cores, historically. So after 9-11, um, things have really changed. So the, the one thing is, yes, we're using concrete a lot more. So we, we did that in the UK anyway, as I mentioned. If you are still using steel, then the protection that they're offering it is far more robust. So sometimes you might use steel, but then you might put a concrete wall around it. So you're basically just protecting it um, in a much better way than they were on those towers. And the other thing they try and do to, if you've got steel cores, is, and we call it redundancy. What that means is if you've got um, three columns that will do the job, so you can put all the load down, and if one column gets taken out, and then the other two columns pick up the load, which was previously taken there, but that causes them to collapse, we would now make either the other two columns strong enough so that they can take that extra load, or we'd stick an extra column in, so we'd put four in instead. So you're basically building in systems so that when the forces are coming down, if it's lost somewhere it should be able to go, it's got somewhere else to go. So you can still create safe steel cores by, by doing these two things together. But yeah, like I said, in the UK, we, don't, we just we use concrete. So that was a lovely use of the word redundancy in the appropriate way, and in the same uh, words with the unions being referred to as well. So we just need to be clear about our interpretation of that. So the next question, please. Gentleman up at, up at the back was early on. Any tips about how we might 
build structures on the moon? Oh, um, I was actually researching this um, for my children's book that I am currently working on. And the European Space Agency is actually working on this. So I am probably kind of telling you third hand what's going on there. But they have some information on their website. What they're looking at is how can we build from material that the moon is made of? Because why would you transport material from the earth? That's silly. Um, water, another problem. We use water and concrete. So what they're trying to do is use... Um, I can't remember what the term is. It's something like revolute or something that they call the actual material that you have on the moon. Regulus. Regulus, that's it, thank you. And it's how, how can, can we heat that up? Can we use the sun's rays when we have the strong sun? Can we actually harness that heat to fuse it together to create a strong material? Or can we use some material which we don't need too much of to mix it in and then create a paste which we can then 3D print with? So those are two different things that they're currently looking at which I think is really fascinating. But yeah, the European Space Agency has got some research happening at the moment on that. It's great. Great. The next question, please. Um, so the Pantheon is still standing mm. 2,000 years later. <laughs> um, do you think the structures that we're building at the moment stand a chance of <laughs> still being standing in the year 4,000? <laughs> um, another very interesting question. So there's two things that need to happen um, in order for our structures to last that long. One is that we have to maintain them properly. Um, and we talk about design life. So when we build our bridges, uh, our nuclear structures, our buildings, there are different design life that we talk about. And that's not how long they will live and then they collapse. It's just that's the time after which they really would need some intervention to come in and maintain them properly. Um, so for nuclear kind of structures, you're talking hundreds of years. For bridges, you're talking just over 100 years. And for buildings, it's normally 60 to 80 years, depending on the building. And on that basis, it's probably unlikely they will last that long. And I think the second thing is climate change. So we are designing stuff for wind forces, for the ground conditions, and so on that currently exist. And if climate change causes quite catastrophic changes over the next 2,000 years, so that you know, say the wind speed triples, then our structures wouldn't make it. So I think those are the two things that um, we have to see. So in short, probably unlikely. But, but may, maybe the big kind of nuclear type facilities would because they're essentially meters of concrete. Um, a co concrete would last. <laughs> um, lady here, please. Thank you. What changes can the construction industry make over the next 10 or 20 years in a transition to a lower carbon economy? What, sorry, I just missed changes. The, what changes? Um, lots. So one thing we talk about is embodied carbon. What that means is if we're building a structure out of concrete and steel, how much carbon was emitted in order to create those materials. So that's one way to reduce um, carbon, and that comes down to kind of the structural engineers and material scientists. So I mentioned using waste products from steel, for example, that massively reduces the amount of carbon um, sink that goes into the concrete. Uh, different materials, so if we're using more timber, that's a much more um, eco-friendly material. So people are looking at, I think the tallest building they've now built out of timber is 14 stories, but they're looking to try and even challenge that further. You can even build a combination, so you could use a steel frame, but mostly make it from timber, that helps. So materials is a big consideration. Um, the other one is, so the off-site manufacturer helps a lot because when you're constructing things and building things quickly in a factory, um, then you're not spending as much time on site, you know, digging things out. The structures are lighter. You're doing less foundations, less materials, more precise. There's less waste. So that's a really good one. And then on, on the other kind of end of the spectrum, it's how much energy are we using to run our buildings? And I don't know what the percentage is, but if you look at the overall percentage of carbon being released by humankind, just running buildings is a quite significant proportion of that. So it's how can we have more efficient ventilation, not using air conditioning too much, um, you know, using natural ways to cool a building, natural ways to cool water, to heat water. So the energy side of things um, is also really important. Okay. Um, Hank, 
Interesting, thank you. My, my question really is, is why, in terms of height going up, and, and, and for whom? I live in Brent, and they had high-rise blocks. I was taught in one, Stonebridge, and another chalky estate, notorious. They knocked them all down, and now they're building in Wembley around the stadium there, mm. massive high-rise blocks again. Mm -hmm. I can see why building something like the Shard is, is, it is, it has attractions. In fact, I've spent our wedding anniversary there because <laughs> of the, the view and, you know. The, but living there, surely most people really want to live not more than probably four, four story, um, four stories up. Isn't that right? Isn't that a sort of human sort of thing that we, we tend to want? So, so I think there's a big cultural aspect there. So I lived um, in a seven story building my, my time in India. Um, you go to places like Hong Kong, people are very comfortable living in high rise. When I lived in Dubai, you paid more rent the higher you went because it's this kind of, again, it's views and it's, 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 you know, it's really lovely. So I think there's a big cultural aspect at play there. I think in the UK, we tend to prefer shorter buildings. That's not true all over the world. Um, my view on this is that in terms of these iconic buildings like the Shard, like the Burj Khalifa, like the Jeddah Tower, they, they will continue to keep pushing boundaries and keep building very tall. But I think in terms of living, if, if we take London as an example, um, I think we need to build more medium rise. So I think we need to be building more kind of six to 12 or six to you know, tw 20 stories even sometimes buildings because that stops spread from happening. And what we don't want to do is to spread London out so far that you know, you're just commuting for hours, that's not helping anybody. Um, and we want to kind of preserve the countryside and basically keep the population's impact as compact as possible. Then people often say, well, London's already very crowded. You know, how can we add more people in? So yes, we need infrastructure to support that. But I then also give the example of um, the density. So how many people think Paris is very dense? I don't think that there's a couple of hands going up. And how many people think London is very dense? No, okay, so, there's a few, so we still had more hands up for London than Paris, but I know there's a few knowing nods happening. Paris is twice as dense as London in its busiest central parts. And the reason is because Paris has these six-story structures everywhere. We have one or two-story Victorian structures. Um, but yet Paris, you know, I, I go there, I don't find it that busy. That may be because I grew up in Bombay, but, you know, um, which is fantastic. But yes, yeah, so, so I think more medium rise, you're going to get the iconic towers happening. But, you know, I, I want to keep cities, you know, compact, basically, and get more people in that way. Thank you. Um, excellent presentation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I was in New York with my family a week ago in Central Park, and there is a huge, uh, two very, very tall, skinny skyscrapers. One yes. is going to be taller than the One World Trade Center. It's really, really skinny. <laughs> so I wanted to take you back to the point you said about the external, not the central core, which is presumably going to be concrete, but the external. Mm. There isn't any external, and it's going to be over 500 meters. How, any idea how that will work. How do they, how are they going to do that? It's just, it's, 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 I can't be more than a <laughs> hundred meters in diameter. I don't know what it is, but so it's think, very yeah. tall and very skinny. I think one of the ones you're probably talking about is 432 something. It's 111 57th Street. 50, yeah. Okay. And there's one more called 432 something, and which is on the- that's next door, yes. Yeah, that's on the German edition of my book. Um, so they do have external systems, but you can't always tell because you know, the gherkin has crosses, which are quite obvious, but these use the vertical structures, basically. And what happens is they have a central core as well as the external structures, and then you, you tie them together. So where, when I bring my ski pole analogy back, I'm using my body, I'm using my arms and the ski poles, but I'm also, sorry, I'm also using my arms. So instead of having a kind of a floppy connection between the two, which would allow that to happen, it's a, it's a fixed connection. So this entire frame, would have to basically be engaged in order to create movement. But um, more than that, the other thing that they do, and I, I kind of glossed over this in the interest of time, um, is a tuned mass damper. So this is Taipei 101, which is over 500 meters tall. And this is, 
in a place that experiences earthquakes and typhoons. Mm. Um, and essentially, they've got this giant ball, which is kind of um, suspended in a three-story space. So, so just to give you an idea of scale. And when the wind blows or an earthquake happens, um, this pendulum essentially starts rocking in a way that counteracts the forces that's acting on the outside of the building and, can, and helps to cancel it out. So it basically dampens like a piston does in our car or our suspension does on our bicycles. Um, and, and the really tall, super skinny towers will 99% have features like that in the building to help the sway. So a building can sway as much as you like. It looks scary. Um, but what it's really about is human perception. So we've worked out what acceleration humans can feel when you're standing or sitting. So that's for an office. And if you're lying down, if you're in a residence, and they're different numbers. So we basically, as engineers, have to limit the, this rate of acceleration that happens rather than the quantity that happens. So we do the analysis, we put these pendulums in if required, and we're basically making sure that the perception isn't there, that you're moving. How, having said that, people anecdotally do tell me that they feel that Chicago and Manhattan skyscrapers, you can kind of feel a little bit of it. In the UK, I guess we just don't have that many tall towers um, in, in the same way, so they feel more robust here, is what I'm anecdotally told. So can I, can I just ask about the difference between feeling and seeing? So, if yeah. so when you've got a nice glass skyscraper, and then just regardless of whether you can feel it, if, if it's really tall, can mm. you see this movement? And is that disconcerting or not? So I would say for the kind of towers um, you mentioned, you would be able to see the movement. If you're at the top, if it's a windy day, it would be very slow. So you'd have to kind of stand there really still. But yeah, I, I think you could see the movement. I am, I'm guessing, because I haven't been up there, but I think you would. <laughs> right, next question, please. Can we have the, uh, the lady here, please? So you mentioned the, that concrete was the second most used resource mm. after water. I read recently about the people actually beginning to not have good sources of sand anymore to mm. make... and bulldozers coming in and scraping off beaches. Where, where is that going? And is there a possibility of recycling our concrete? So if the building is only going to last 60 years, what are we going to do with all of that in 60 yeah. years? Was that on the 99% Invisible podcast that you heard that? Or it was, there was a Forbes article as well, I think. One or the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I really high, highly recommend that podcast, by the way, 99% Invisible. They talk about all these kind of design things. Um, I'm not involved in that, by the way. It's just, um, it's a really good question, and that was the first time I heard of it, so that that was quite news to me as well. And on this podcast, they were saying that there's actually like mafia that trade in sand, and there's crime to do with sand now, um, because sand is used a lot in the manufacture of concrete. And from what I heard on this podcast, so this is not something I know about enough personally, but the, what they said on the podcast was that the sand in like in the deserts of the Sahara, for example are very worn down and they're very round, and so they don't form an effective material compared to sand that you get on beaches, for example. So, um, yes, we need to recycle concrete. So the way we recycle concrete is we crush it down into stones. And you know I said when you make a concrete mix, you're mixing cement powder, water, and then aggregate, which I said was rubble. You essentially use old concrete for that. So that's how you can recycle concrete. Um, but I mean, it's all the more reason that we need to be looking for other sources of materials to use and, and waste materials that we can use in the concrete rather than trying to use new, th you know, new materials all the time. So yeah, really interesting point and something that I would love to know more about myself. Great. The uh, question just here, please. Thank you. Thank you. That was most interesting. Firstly, the amplitude of movement that you might get at the top of one of these tall buildings, what sort of amplitude, and sneakily as well. Um, the um, uh, use of timber that's being done now, that, that's not just pieces of wood. There's stuff done to it. Perhaps yeah. you could explain briefly. Sure. So to so answer your first question, um, in simple terms, it's the height of a building divided by 500. 
that's the kind of the physical limit we tend to aim for. So a 500 meter tall tower would move a meter sideways. Um, most towers would move less than that because if it moved that much, it is pretty likely you'd be able to feel it. So we tend to restrict it. But that, that's, that's something that we start with, you know, back of the envelope calculations that, you know, it's, it's a starting point. Um, your second question about timber. So again, it's not a material I have used a lot, but they're using things like CLT, which is cross laminated timber um, and different forms of that in which they take um, basically thinner layers of timber. And then because the, the weak point in timber is, is the grain, that's what I'm looking for, um, depending on which direction the grain is running in, the strength of the timber can vary a lot in different directions. So what you want to try and do is make it as um, uniform as possible. So you basically s glue layers of timber on top of each other and keep crossing the grains so that when you end up with a beam that's made out of lots of these layers, that has got quite a uniform strength happening in lots of different directions. So that tends to be the material we're using. Um, and again, I don't know enough about this, but there, there are ways to fireproof it now, which are clever, and that we, you know, we couldn't do before. So part of that could be impregnating it with resins or chemicals, essentially, that makes the wood itself um, quite fire resistant. But then there are other woods, there are lots of woods which, and I, I think... Um, maybe somebody in the audience knows more about this than me, but the hardwoods, I believe, when they char, they actually insulate the rest of the wood. So what they do is they, they know that if, you know, two centimeters, say, of a beam is burnt, but they know that that much will then insulate the rest of the beam in the case of a fire, and so they know how much of the beam or column would be left, and then they can check that, oh, is that, little, is that remaining piece enough to stand up for X amount of time to allow people to escape safely. So these are some of the different ways in which timber is being brought um, in, into kind of the modern way of design. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I have a slightly different question. Do you think enough thought is put into maintenance of these tall buildings when the building process is actually going on. How will the maintenance regime be conducted many, many years subsequent to the building being constructed? And have any lessons been learned from previous failures where maintenance has been turned out, has turned out to be a cause of failure? Thank you. Um, so maybe the second part, and, and again, I, I, I don't know enough, but some of the recent bridge collapses that have happened, there was one in Italy, for example, they talk about a problem with the maintenance. Um, there was, I think that was a mixture of different materials being used and, you know, I don't think we really construct in that way anymore. So there was a question about how that should be maintained. So yes, there are lessons to be learned from maintenance. And then to answer the kind of the first part of your question, yes, absolutely, we have to think about maintenance right from day one. So in a building like the Shard, for example, um, there are these really cool little robots that have been hidden in at at different intervals up the height of the building. So there will be days when you walk past and around kind of level 30 something, there'll be a bit of glass open and there'll be a kind of arm with a cradle sticking out. Um, so there's, there's, you know, the bit which sticks out off the side, that part of the building has got some on the roof and then the main tower has got a couple of them. And at the very top of the tower is what we call a telescopic crane. And um, that crane was used to help build the last bit of the tower, but then it remains there, again, for maintenance. So they're basically, the entire surface area of the tower has been checked that it is accessible by one of these cradles and crane systems in order to be able to clean it and replace glass if required, replace the gaskets if required, and so on. Um, those are interesting to us as structural engineers because they're obviously moving loads, they're dynamic loads. So, you know, this telescopic crane at the top, for example, sits on top of um, four columns, and as the arm swings around, the force on the columns changes. So we have to design for that right in the beginning. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something we think about. Great. We have time for one more question. Uh, gentlemen, just here, please. Hello there. I'm uh, I'm a chemist, so I found the first part of your uh, lecture very interesting. But talking about the future and talking about graphene and um, carbon, are we ever likely to be able to build a cable up which a vehicle could go to a geosynchronous orbit at twenty-four thousand miles? 
I'd like to think so. <laughs> Someone once asked me what my kind of dream structure would be, and I said a lift to the moon. I think that would be kind of cool. I don't know. Probably there's more complicated things about the rotation and revolutions <coughs> of the two planets, which wouldn't allow that to happen. But um, I don't know. I think at the moment, one of the challenges we have using different forms of carbon in structures is fire protection. So I've seen a form of bridge that's called a stress ribbon bridge. And those are a little bit like rope bridges. Um, so if you imagine, you know, you've got two points, you suspend a cable, and then you put planks of concrete on top, and then you kind of tie it all up together. So that's essentially what stress ribbon bridge is. And there's some research being done in Germany to replacing cables made from steel with carbon fiber, much lighter, much stronger. Um, and you need very little amount of carbon. You know, the thickness of the carbon is, is minuscule compared to the amount of steel you require. But they struggle with two things. One is that... Um, they haven't found a way to make the material so that it doesn't split very easily. So you just basically get these little cracks in the material, then it cracks, um, and then you've lost your strength. So that's one thing they're trying to figure out. And the other one is fire. So if, if that material gets burnt, then it just loses its strength. So I think there's one thing to talk about graphene and, and all these things as theoretical materials that are really strong, but then when you bring them, obviously, into the real world, then there's all these different practicalities that need to be thought about. So I, I, I don't know. I'd like to think that we can build some um, crazy structures in the future. Thank you very much. So, Roma, um, I would like to uh, thank you on behalf of the audience and, and our online audience as well for a, a, a talk this evening that has really brought to life um, the world of the built environment, uh, the challenges that we have, um, but the opportunities too regarding building skyscrapers. I was particularly taken... Uh, with your comment, really, about the sort of the deep uh, question. It was from uh, Hank in the audience, really, as well, about actually what's the purpose about, you know, what do we want as a society? Do we want these tall structures? What are the benefits? You've been very clear about societal benefits and, and density and about the benefits, therefore, of tall structures. And I was also extremely taken with your reference to learning from nature as well. So, for example, with the Redwoods, and therefore how they are able to p uh, cope with fires, and therefore are these materials that we should be thinking about. So thank you so much indeed yeah, for a fantastic you. talk this evening, and if you would join me in uh, thanking Roma in the traditional way. Thank you very much.